Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing. Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop-off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... Can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. You enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad free listening by going to the Patreon page and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Tanya Luna about her book, The Leader Lab, Core Skills to Become a Great Manager Faster. Tanya Luna, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Oh, thank you. Oh, you said my first and last name. I felt like I got in trouble for a moment. Hopefully not. <laughs> it is a pleasure to have you with me today. You're joining us from Pennsylvania. I am south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And mm-hmm. today we're going to be talking about your book, The Leader Lab, Core Skills to Become a Great Manager Faster. I love the title, love the concept of the book, and I'm excited to dig it in, and dig into it with you and to really um, get some great insights on how we can be more effective in our leadership roles uh, right away. Uh, as we get started, I wanted to share Tanya's bio with everybody. Tanya Luna, originally from Brooklyn, is the co-founder of Life Labs Learning, author of The Leader Lab, and co-host of the podcast Talk Psych to Me. Luna is a researcher, educator, advisor to alt protein startups and partner at Columbia University's eLab, an accelerator for entrepreneurs who increase equity and access in education. Her company, Life Labs Learning, has helped over 350,000 people at some of the world's most influential companies, including TED, Yelp, Tinder, Slack, Reddit, JetBlue, and almost 2,000 clients become more confident, competent, and compassionate leaders. Her podcast blends humor and psychology to help people get better at being people. Her TED Talk about her experience as a Ukrainian immigrant and the power of perspective has over 1.8 million views. Tanya lives with 16 rescued animals, pigs, dogs, goats, and cats, uh, and the love of her life. In everything she does, she strives to bring people instructions for human kindness, Rooted in research and play, her work and book have been featured in Time, Harvard Business Review, Psychology Today, CNBC, NPR, and more. You can find out more about her at www.tanyaluna.com. Again, a pleasure to have you. I could go on and on, but I'm going to pause there. Yeah, oh my gosh, you, you found the long version of my bio. I appreciate you sharing. I want to give you a chance to, to elucidate on anything, anything else you would like to add by way of your background for yes, the audience. There, this, this bio is heavily outdated in that now I live with 21 animals. In my home, <laughs> that's the only major update. That's a great update. Um, and you know, I, I'm a dog person. I have a couple dogs, but I can't compete with 21 animals in your home. <laughs> Nor we do have you. we have we have two dogs. We have a hedgehog, and we have two frogs. Oh my um, god! So, so I guess we have five. That is amazing. Okay, that, I, I, <laughs> I'm guessing that is not what you want to talk about today. But at some point, I would love to learn about your frogs and hedgehogs. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, good. Let's let's go ahead and dive on in. Um, I always like to ask authors as we start talking about books, like why this book? Why now? Um, you know, books are a labor of love. So what really was the impetus for this book? Yeah, well, prior to the book, 
you know, my heart and soul and, and labor <laughs> went into Life Labs Learning, which is my company that does leadership training that you mentioned earlier. And one of the things that we feel really passionately about is making the skills that we teach increasingly accessible. You know, you're seeing more and more as companies grow and change and there's so much uncertainty and that the pace of change is accelerating. More people need to be effective leaders, both formal and informal. And people with the official role of manager at any level, they really are struggling. And that is painful for the managers themselves, for the people that they support for the entire organization. When a manager is not very effective, engagement plummets, uh, stress spikes, productivity, effectiveness goes down. That hurts the workplace. It also hurts society because you know it's not like you come home from a really terrible workplace experience and are able to just switch it off entirely. You're still that same person with that same stress and that same frustration. So anyway, we were really seeing the need for more accessibility of these skills. And we do it through our workshops. We wanted to make the book even more widely accessible. Of course, we hope that you read the book. You also do live training, but we didn't want uh, you know, just training to be the one option that we provide. Yeah. Well, dissemination is so important. And I love that you're getting your work out there and having such a huge, vast impact. That's incredible. So you've done a lot of research. You've studied great managers and top companies. You've worked with lots of top companies. What have you found to be some of the most common themes for what makes them stand out versus, you know, the, the average person, you know, who who just is doing their best, but they don't really know what they're doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I'll start with two broad themes and then uh, I can go into the specific skills that came out of our research on what makes great managers different in this day and age. Two high level themes is that there's no correlation, for better or worse, between years of experience as a manager and effectiveness as a manager. In fact, sometimes there's an inverse correlation, meaning you do it longer and you actually become less effective. That is scary and sad because learning on the job and learning through experience is the number one strategy that most companies use to develop their managers. Uh, but it's really hard and it's a really confusing to learn from experience because how do I know if you know, the reason someone's quitting today, what did I do six months ago that led that person to make that decision? So number one is, number one takeaway from that is that these skills really need to be something we develop deliberately. It can't just be, you know, hoping that you'll absorb it through that experience alone. So that's theme number one is, you know, experience doesn't translate to effectiveness. Yeah. It's one of the things that bugs me the most. There's many things that bug me about job postings. <laughs> but one of the things that bugs me the most is when you have these arbitrary years of experience, years of experience. I hate that it. are listed. Uh, you know, in some cases I could see how that might be relevant, but in most cases, I don't see what it matters. Like five yeah. years of crappy experience does not mean you're better qualified for this job than anybody else. Right. And so I think we really need to question this whole years of experience thing. Yeah. And, um, it's such and a, the, a, the skills a that go into being an effective manager and an effective leader don't necessarily connect with what that person who has the five or 10 years of experience has been doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's not, it, you know, I, I don't know who said uh, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect, right? It's not about how long you do it. It's how well you're practicing that thing. Uh, and I completely agree with you on that, on that frustration. I think years of experience can be so limiting for various reasons. It's not a predictor of effectiveness. You're not looking at what are the skills that I can observe you're just guessing at how effective someone is going to be based on their number of years. And it can be such a blocker too. If we're passionate about diversity and inclusion and you're setting that expectation, then you're also potentially holding back a lot of individuals who could be phenomenal in the role. So yes, I, I will get on that, that soapbox with you. Um, number two that we saw among great managers when we contrast them to average is that they really kind of unconsciously or consciously rethink what the word manage even means. You know, it can really, it really is a synonym for control. And average managers really think about managing people. Like, how do I get this person to do this thing? How do I motivate this person? When you look at great managers, they're really thinking more about managing conditions. Like, what does this person need from me, from the organization to be at their best? What kind of information do they need? What kind of resources do they need? What kind of, you know, rhythms in our work do they need? And so they're really exerting their influence on the kind of the the ecosystem around the individual versus trying to think about how do I sort of force this specific individual to take these actions that I want them to take. Oh, I, I agree. I, I think that's absolutely important. 
Um, so yeah, let's start building this foundation around uh, creating positive conditions, uh, yeah. psychologically safe workplaces, yeah. uh, healthy, uh, psychologically, but physically healthy workplaces, like pe- yeah. places, uh, you know, where we talk about DEI stuff, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, but let's not forget about the really where that the culmination is in the belonging culture. Yeah. So let's focus around creating that environment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when we do that, man, that just makes all the difference. Yeah. There's, um, Kurt Lewin, who is, you know, one of the kind of founding, speakers or, or writers on, in the area of organizational psychology uh, has this Lewin's law equation, which is behavior is a function of the person and the environment, which sounds very, very simple, but it's actually very profound because so often we go, there's a behavior problem with this person. Let me fix the person. Actually, much more effective is remembering behavior is a function of the person and the environment. Let me first see to your point, what's going on in the space, what's going on in the environment, what's going on in the culture. And you will actually see much better results and much more scalable and sustainable results. If you're first focusing on that behavior, on that, on that environment, on that ecosystem. And when you don't focus on the the environment, which is the system in which all this yeah. behavior happens, then yeah. you're just playing whack-a-mole because yeah. you, you can try to address the behavior of a particular individual, but right. it's the system, not the individual. That's right. really the root cause of the problem. And so it's just going to keep manifesting in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think about it as like, if everyone's kind of drinking toxic water, do you want to treat the symptoms of having consumed toxic water, or do you want to get the toxins out of the water? And so again, you know, what we're noticing is great managers, great leaders, they're thinking about that water, what's in that water versus, you know, what what are this, what are the symptoms that I'm seeing on the surface? Uh, and so one of the things that we also got really curious about, and this was really the heart of what this book is, the leader lab, the heart of what we do at Life Labs Learning, the, the leadership development company is what are the skills that differentiate great managers? Um, one of the things that we were excited to find is that you don't need this vast number of skills. We found that it's a really a small number of what we call tipping point skills, that if you develop those, if you're really core, it's almost like core strength, if you think about it physically, you don't need to learn every exercise that's out there. But if you get that really core strength going, everything else becomes easier. You can, you can, you know, have this much broader range of motion in the same way when it comes to manager skills, there's a small number of skills. If you get good at them, they kind of unlock your ability to handle everything else. Um, And so what we found by observing, not just asking people, turns out when you ask people, what do you do differently? They don't know. But by observing people, (laughs) back to that whole experience doesn't always correlate. Self-awareness doesn't always correlate. So uh, the what we found are eight skills that that make the biggest difference. Uh, number one is coaching skills, or essentially questions. How do you ask the kind of question that un- unlocks someone's insights? Uh, feedback skills, prioritization. How do you help people understand what truly is most important in this sea of urgency that we're all in? How to lead effective one on ones where you're both kind of diagnosing and supporting people's sense of engagement. Honestly, those four, if you just get those four, you see so much impact so quickly. Uh, As the role becomes more high pressure, more complex, we also add on being able to um, uh, think strategically and help your team think strategically as well, anticipating risks, you know, planning for uncertainty, leading really high quality inclusive meetings where you're hearing from everyone, where you're taking action, um, being able to lead change effectively, and then finally being really thoughtful about how do you develop the skill set on your team, not just for today, but for tomorrow. So strategic thinking, meeting facilitation, change, people development. So those eight, if you really, really focus in on those, and we see incredibly rapid progress, we focus on how we teach, but even just starting with the what you focus on uh, allows this, this, it's almost like learning the scales when you're learning to play the piano. I just started doing that Simply Piano app. <laughs> it's like, you know, the scales, you can play any song eventually. Yeah. And nothing you just shared is rocket science. No, so this is a common drum beat. I, I'm like leadership, yeah. effective leadership. Um, you know, there are, it, it is hard work. 
Um, yeah. But it's not rocket science. It's not hard work because it's so mind-bendingly complicated. Like there right. are simple things that you just, it's hard work because you have to do it consistently. Right. Um, you have to pay attention to it. You have to do it consistently over time. You have to be willing to hold the mirror up in front of your face and practice self-reflection uh, yeah. to, to, to make adjustments over time. All of that's hard. And right. treat it as a craft, as a discipline versus yes. something that is like a, a quality or a personality. Though to challenge you a little bit on that, we have trained rocket scientists multiple times <laughs> and they find it incredibly challenging. <laughs> but, but to your point, I think that it is challenging when it is kind of this this floaty concept, like even something like feedback skills, people are really intimidated by. If you break it down, we call it breaking it down to the behavioral unit. So what is this very specific thing? For for example, a very small behavioral unit that we zero in on in our training is something we call deep blurring. So if I say something like uh, that piece of communication was messy, messy is a blur word. And immediately, not only am I going to get triggered by that, that's when my amygdala is going to get riled up, the part of my brain responsible for ego protection and fight or flight. I also can't learn from it. What the heck is messy? Your perception of messy might be different from mine. Bias could be lurking within there. And so a very simple thing we teach people is how do you get the blur words out of your language? And so you say something like, I noticed that it had no paragraph breaks, or uh, you know, I, I saw that there were um, six points uh, that you wanted your reader to remember in within one page. So things like that are de-blurring that communication. So that takes it out of the realm of, ah, this is scary. This is confusing. I don't know if I could do it well. And it breaks it down like rocket science <laughs> into those very specific, concrete, tangible components. Uh, and so in, in many ways, I think we've made it harder than rocket scientist science, but it doesn't have to be. And, and you mentioned, I mean, there is kind of this notion of just the great leader, right? The the oh. charismatic great leader who just has innate it, it, it's it's like talent within them, and yeah. they, they just are a natural. And certainly, right. people have different talents and different skills, and some come more easily to others, you know, whatever. Um, but everything you just mentioned is learnable. It's oh, apply. Yeah. It's it, you can apply it. You can see immediate impact, and you can see a difference. And whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, a charismatic right. person or kind of a reserved person, whether you are a rocket scientist or you're in <laughs> right. retail or you're you're fixing sprinklers or whatever, like anyone yeah. can do this right. um, if you'll pay attention to it. Yeah. Uh, and and because of you know we we I think we do it a disservice when we talk about soft skills. Oh. Um, I'm with you. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with with the skills themselves, but right. But, but why the, the packaging? The, the packaging around soft skills, people start to say, "Oh, well, that's not really that important," or right. that's just this 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 fluffy stuff that doesn't really matter. I'm a I'm a numbers guy, or what right. you know. So people start to say those sorts of things. I'm like, soft skills regardless of how you frame it, these are essential skills. These are essential human skills that yeah. will allow you to be effective in the current workplace, but in the future of work as well. Every yeah. leader, every manager, every supervisor needs to develop these skills. Uh, and you can, that's the thing is you can develop them. Yeah. And they become the foundation of technical skills as well. You can be incredibly, you know, effective at whatever it is, data analysis or sales. And if you don't have the people skills underlying that, it can really hold you back throughout your career. And the funny thing is that apparently the term soft skills was developed by the military in the U.S. as mm -hmm. uh, kind of a distinction from technical skills, but they called them soft skills and kind of created the distinction because they recognized the extent to which they were essential. They right. just, I think, had a little bit of a branding problem. But the the heart of it is that it started off with an organization that you often don't associate with soft skills, <laughs> with these people skills, recognizing that those were the skills that were really badly needed within, you know, within their entire, uh, for their entire ability to be effective. Yeah. And there's lots of ways that people could try to reframe the whole idea of soft skills. One that I've heard recently that I like is this idea of durable skills. These are mm. transferable skills that are going to be important in like any work environment as you're moving in different types of industries, different types of jobs, working with different teams. These are essential skills, essential skill sets that are going to help you interact yeah. with other human beings in an yeah. effective way. So whatever yeah. way you package it, you know, let's just remember that these skills are essential. 
yes, find that package <laughs> and that works for you, that works for your team and and really embrace it. I, I a colleague of mine calls them survival skills, um, which I also really like. I mean, company wide, we call them core skills, but yeah, whatever you call it. You know, to to your earlier point, absolutely anyone can get better in these areas. I also don't know that that means that everyone should be in a management or leadership role. I believe that increasingly some degree of informal leadership will be necessary for everyone in every role. But I also see one of the issues that we, you know, run into as we work with these organizations is that people are kind of chucked into the manager role, the formal mm-hmm. leader role, um, either without knowing what they're getting into or kind of knowing, but dreading it, but it's the only way to make more money or feel like you're progressing in your career. So, uh, you know, it's almost like the the correlation, I'm talking a lot about correlations today, but it's actually really funny the extent to which we think things are related that they're not. Uh, There's very little overlap between being effective in a, an individual contributor role. Let's say you're the best architect in your company that has no predictive validity for whether you'll be an effective manager of architects. And so another thing that I, I, you know, often think about is if you're going to pour effort and energy into developing these skills, make sure that you're making it clear to people what this role is so they can self-select in or out. And then ideally, you're also creating other development and a kind of prestige opportunities within your organization. So you're not forcing people to step into this very difficult, very, um, emotional and intense role. Uh, ideally the people that are in it want to be in it. Yeah. And one way of, of terming that is this concept, the, the Peter principle, yeah. um, you know, being, being promoted to your level of incompetence. Uh, right. So many people who are great salespeople, great engineers, great coders, whatever, then because they're so good in their individual contributor role, then now they're given supervisory or leadership responsibilities and they flounder because they, it's, it's a different skill set. Like it's, it's different. a totally and it's different. Not that it's, and, and I think oftentimes, you know, that's assumed that mm, you kind of are, are behind or something, or you're lacking if you're not in this formal leadership role. But I I have just as much respect and admiration for someone who is, has deep expertise and scholarship within their role as someone who is a manager. And in many cases, what we find is that managers who are not as skilled in the particular domain as their team can be much more effective because mm-hmm. they're not solving all the problems for everyone because they're not micromanaging in the same way. Yep. They're actually yep. acting as they should, which is as an amplifier or a multiplier of the effectiveness of their team. So sometimes not being the best individual contributor can actually lead you to be one of the best managers. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier this idea of tipping point skills. Yeah. Um, there are lots of things we can try to do um, to, to improve our abilities and um, Gallup, for example, I think it's Gallup, uh, Strengths Finders, that uh, talks about uh, building on strengths and then you have derailers that you're trying to address yeah. so that they don't disrupt your career. Um, I imagine in some ways, tipping point skills might be similar. Um, maybe let's speak to that a little bit and why we should focus perhaps more on on tipping point skills um, than just like the shotgun approach of just saying, I need to be good at all eight of these uh, things right immediately. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you're bringing that up. I mean, To start, less is more. And also, even within those tipping point skills, we actually see that people do really well by focusing on their strengths within the tipping point skills, right? So even if you take this narrow um, grouping of important skills, even there, you can really build on the things that are already coming naturally to you. I think the strengths finder folks say, like, focus on uh, building on what was put in versus fixing what was left out. So I'm a firm believer in that. But um, in terms of why less is more, what we find, I'll, I'll do, I'll, I'll quote someone that I, I can't remember who said this, um, but this idea of, you know, if you're looking for water and you dig a uh, hundred shallow wells, you'll make less progress than one deep well. So part of it is just about depth of skill, depth of expertise. If you're slightly good at a whole bunch of things, that actually leads to less impact because it's that depth that then translates over into knowing how to apply that skill and that tool in 
thousands of different situations. So if I'm really, really good at just feedback, for example, that unlocks my ability to have difficult conversations, to delegate well, to manage conflict, to negotiate well. So it's only that depth that kind of unlocks all of those other abilities and skills. So that's part of it. Um, So effectiveness. The other reason I would say is just cognitive overload. It is incredibly stressful to try to get good at everything at the same time. It's, you know, going back to, because I'm learning to play the piano, I'll just use that as an example. You know, if I was learning to play the piano and the guitar and the cymbals and, you know, some other instrument, my brain would just be so fried. I wouldn't want to do any of it. If I focus on one thing, not only am I managing my energy really well, I'm also partnering with the unconscious part of my brain that's still practicing the piano when I'm not thinking about it, that's still practicing the piano when I'm asleep. So having that um, focus of attention allows you to have the energy to sustain and to continue growing. And it allows you to use the parts of your brain that aren't consciously attending to deepening that skill. And so much of skill building is actually happening beneath the surface. If we're spreading ourselves too thin, another example might be like, imagine reading 10 books at the same exact time. I know some of us are guilty of doing that. (laughs) It's really hard to think deeply about each of those books and glean insights. It's only when you're reading that one book, you're thinking about it consciously and unconsciously that all of these insights and aha moments start to happen. Um, And then lastly, from a learning retention perspective, if you practice the same thing over and over, if you reflect on the same thing, you just develop that skill so much faster. And it doesn't mean that you don't get to develop more skills. It's just ideally small quantity, one at a time. It's impossible to focus on everything all at once, right? So let's just um, try to, to take you know, it's this idea, even I, I hear um, a lot, you know, just be 5% better, like focus on just being a little bit better. If you're just 1%, 2%, 5% better, a little bit better focusing on something every day over the course of a month, six months, a year, you see yeah. tremendous growth. But if you're right. like trying to go from zero to 80, uh, you know, immediately, it's just overload. You can't do it. Yeah. Um, and, and you're going to flounder. I have a, I don't know why I'm so quotey today, but I was just thinking of the writer, Chris Giobo. He says, we underestimate how much we can get done in a year and we overestimate how much we can get done in a day, right? So in a day, we're constantly like, oh, I can do these 10 things. And at the end of the day, you, you hate yourself because you're like, I did three things. But then we significantly underestimate how much incredible progress we can make if we're just, to your point, chipping away, you know, that small bit of progress, that 1%, 5% improvement every day, every week, you get to see with that kind of attention and and diligence, you get to see incredible progress. And actually, if you zoom out in a very short period of time, a year is not a long time if you just do the work of the discipline. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tanya, this has just been a fascinating conversation. We've only scratched the surface, but that's why you have a great book that everyone should check out before we wrap things up for today. And I let you go. I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Okay. Sounds great. So I will say if you're interested in leadership training, live live and digital learning, our website is lifelabslearning.com. The book is called The Leader Lab, Core Skills to Become a Great Manager Faster, available wherever books are sold. Uh, And if you're interested in some of the work that I'm doing, I have a new book coming out in September. My website, as you mentioned in the beginning, is tanyaluna.com, and that's T-A-N-I-A-L-U-N-A.com. And then, ooh, did you say final word? My final word? This is so much pressure. (laughs) Okay, I will say if you want a better world, start with better leaders in the workplace. So often we forget that the workplace can be a practice lab for learning life's most useful skills. So if you're frustrated at work, fantastic. That's your opportunity to develop those skills and to develop the relationships and the ecosystem, to your point earlier, that will not only lead to a better workplace, but will resonate out to create more communication, collaboration, compassion in the broader world. I love it. Tanya, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage my audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Tanya can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. You enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support.
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.